Hello, welcome back to my bookshelf. This is Justine Brown. Please do subscribe if you haven't already. Today we're talking about a Machiavellian manual written for Charles II. Charles II was fortunate in his temperament. He embodied the cavalier sensibility of loyalty, wit, courage, love of pleasure, and nonchalance. The young king's famous high spirits flagged after a series of crushing defeats, however. First, there had been the execution of his father, Charles I, in 1649. Following this, Charles II had made false promises to a grim set of Scottish Presbyterians in order to be crowned at Scone Palace, Scotland, telling the Presbyterians that their religious preferences would prevail. He had led an army of Scots against Oliver Cromwell's forces and had been routed at the Battle of Worcester in 1651. This marked the end of the English Civil Wars. There followed a perilous escape to the continent, the story of which he would later enjoy recounting to the likes of diarist Samuel Pepys. The tale resembles a picaresque novel. It took the embattled Charles months to flee from an England under roundhead rule. He only did so with the help of brave supporters, both nobles and commoners. Pepys learned firsthand, quote, of the king's difficulties, where it made me ready to weep to hear the stories, as how he was fain to eat a piece of bread and cheese out of a poor boy's pocket, end quote or famously spend the night in the branches of a great oak tree, snatching sleep in the arms of a friend while roundhead soldiers searched the woods below. The king dressed in rough peasant clothes. Because of his height, he was unable to disguise himself as a woman, as his 14-year-old brother James had done in order to elude his captors five years previously. Night after night, various well-wishers saw the king had somewhere to lay his head. Samuel Pepys again, quote, At a Catholic house, he was fain to lie in the priest's hole a good while for his privacy, unquote. The recusant family priest, Father J John Huddleston, washed the fugitive's sore and be bleeding feet. Charles promised better days ahead for Catholics. Later, he and a royalist lady called Jane Lane rode miles on horseback, posing as an eloping couple. Multiple times, Charles II was nearly chased to ground like a fox. When he finally slipped away from the hounds and made it to France to join his mother Henrietta Maria's cavalier court in exile, his family scarcely knew him, so raggedy and thin was he, and down to just one companion. Charles then suffered through a period of intense melancholy. Finally, the embattled Stuart considered his options. How would he gain the keys to the three kingdoms? An answer came in the form of a manual of statecraft penned by the exiled royalist general, William Cavendish, later Duke of Newcastle. Newcastle, who had been Charles's childhood governor, wrote the manual in the long tradition of a mirror for princes, um, which Niccolo Machiavelli's prince belongs to. Newcastle refers to this gray mirror simply as his little book. Its modern editor, Gloria Italiano Anzalotti, redubbed the work an English prince, stressing Newcastle's debt to Machiavelli. The prince, though dedicated to Lorenzo de' Medici, concerns statecraft in general and has found a wide audience, whereas Newcastle's little book is meant for English rulers in particular. Newcastle was well placed to advise Charles II during the bleak 1650s because, unlike Machiavelli, he was a prince himself. He had a collection of coronets. Viscount, then Earl, Marquess, and finally Duke. In our time, when the hereditary nobles have been transmuted, as the novelist Bella Pollen puts it, from lions to unicorns, we tend to forget in modernity that these aristocrats weren't merely decorative. They governed smaller territories within a kingdom. 
In times of war, the monarch expected the nobility to raise armies from their local region. Newcastle was a skilled officer. The historian Leander de Lisle reports that, quote, on the battlefield, he had a reputation for fighting with utter fearlessness. When the battle was over, however, he would retire to his music and softer pleasures, refusing to be disturbed upon what occasion soever. Unquote. The man lived in high style regardless of circumstances. Newcastle was well placed at court, but he also held a court of his own. His country house, Welbeck Abbey, was home to the Welbeck Circle, a group which included mathematicians, natural philosophers, musicians, fine artists, and playwrights like Ben Jonson. Johnson created a number of masks for Welbeck that rivaled those of the Stuart court. A great literary patron, Newcastle also wrote plays and poems. His greatest passion, however, was horsemanship. Renowned throughout Europe for his equestrian skills, the great Civil War general instituted a riding school and authored a book on dressage entitled A New Method and Extraordinary Invention to Dress Horses, and work them according to nature. Perhaps Newcastle's greatest gift to his master in this dark time was optimism. He wrote the little book at a moment when the banished royalists appeared to be out of luck as well as money. Nonetheless, he exuded confidence that all manner of things would end well. As he writes in the dedication, quote, I am bold to humbly present this book now because I think your majesty will have more leisure to read it now than when you are enthroned. Newcastle probably felt that royalists had the weight of English history on their side. Monarchy was the norm. Today's reactionaries, by contrast, have to contend with the sheer ubiquitousness of the Whig history progress narrative. Newcastle had been living on the continent since the Battle of Marston Moor in 1644. He and the other royalist commander, Charles I's swashbuckling nephew, Prince Rupert of the Palatinate, had fallen out over the question of strategy. The battle had been fought against Newcastle's advice, and when Parliament won the day, he quit the field and the country of his birth. Parliament having declared him a traitor and sequestered his estates, the nobleman was living on credit. He joined Queen Henrietta Maria's court in exile, where he met and then married one of her young maids of honor, a shy bookworm named uh, Margaret Lucas. Once married to the great patron, the timid young lady metamorphosed into the extravagant authoress known as Mad Madge, Duchess of Newcastle. The group's circle in Paris and later at Rubens' house in Antwerp included René Descartes, Father Pierre Gassendi, and Thomas Hobbes. Newcastle's thought was informed by Hobbes as well as Machiavelli. Taliano tells us that the royalist exiles, quote, discovered greater kingdoms within their minds, unquote. But most of the Duke's advice is drawn from practical experience and observation. His touch is light, quote, there is no oratory in it or anything stolen out of books, for I seldom or ever read any, unquote. His style is eminently cavalier, fusing carelessness with true devotion, quote, if you like it not, sire, I humbly beg that favor of you <clears throat> to throw it in the fire so that it may become a flaming sacrifice of my duty to your majesty, unquote. Newcastle's prescriptions are direct and plain. Social order is the greatest good, monarchy invested by the church is the surest path to harmony, and so monarchy must thrive. In a biography of her husband, the Duchess of Newcastle claims that he ward warned Charles I that civil war was imminent. His manual of statecraft is designed to help the heir ward off such chaos. Quote, no mischief can come equal to that of a civil war, he stresses. The little book itself had been occasioned by one. 
The problem now was to remedy the results. Rather than directly criticize the Stuarts, Newcastle praises England, Elizabeth I as England's model ruler. Queen, quote, Queen Elizabeth's government is absolutely the best precedent for England's government, unquote. The Virgin Queen, cited repeatedly, has only one fault in his eyes. She failed to quash the Puritan faction as soon as it emerged. Quote, that which has done much hurt to, in our church is this. In Queen Elizabeth's time, Old Burley, her chief minister, favored the Puritan faction too much. This should have been looked to in time, unquote. Religious splintering has had direct political consequences in the form of rebellion, war, and regicide. It is Newcastle's view that the monarch must control the church. Quote, Although I know your majesty will have respect for tender consciences, sir, there is nothing that can settle the church and keep it in order as having the church in your own hands, unquote. It does not occur to him that Henry VIII's move to merge church and state might have rendered both institutions more brittle and less sacred in the long run and set further revolutions in motion. The fact that his family, the Cavendishes, had been direct beneficiaries of the new dissolution of the monasteries may account for this blind spot. Newcastle emphasizes hard and soft power in the quest for social order. Indeed, his first chapter concerns militias. Newcastle argues that the king should keep a standing army under his control rather than rely solely upon aristocrats to raise soldiers. The main purpose post-Civil War appears to be mastering the kingdom itself rather than defense, which is why a standing army was considered controversial. In practical terms, sovereignty equals mastery of the collective entity. London must be tamed first, writes Newcastle, echoing his friend Thomas Hobbes, as he summons up the sea monster from the book of Job. Quote, to begin with, that great leviathan, that monster being the head, and that head much too big for the body of the Commonwealth of England, when you master that city, you master the whole kingdom. That cursed city has contributed more to this horrid late rebellion than all the rest of England, Unquote. The London mob was, after all, notorious by this point, having done violence to many royalists in the course of the 1640s. Apprentices tended to riot, especially on Shrove Tuesday. But more than that, the urban merchant class had funded the re revolution. The author's advice on crowd control is specific. Quote, have two royal forts built on both sides of the River Thames. Then the Tower of London is to be well fortified. By commanding the river, command the town. Thus your majesty will tame that rebellious city, and so, consequently, all England that depends on it. Keep this city from hurting you, he urges further. Outside of London, however, arsenal should be hidden, quote, for the people love not the cudgel, unquote. Soft power plays a crucial role in the quest for harmony. Newcastle emphasizes the importance of ceremony. This is one of his chief reasons for preferring Anglicanism over Calvinism, of course. Pageantry reifies hierarchy in all things. It describes and instills the social order using visible signs. The Duke writes that, quote, ceremony is everything. Without it, what did our late king come to? Murdered without ceremony, unquote. We saw in a previous video that the execution of Charles I explicitly mocked the court masks that celebrated the royalist ethos of harmony. If the topsy-turvy world is to be righted once more, rank must be observed at all times and places. New Newcastle once again invokes the propaganda genius, Virgin Queen and Gloriana Elizabeth I, when he urges Charles II to cultivate mystery by showing himself but rarely, quote, and when you do, show yourself gloriously like a god. Say, God bless you, my good people, when 
the people see you thus, they will get down on their knees, worship you, and pray for you as they did for Queen Elizabeth." Unquote. Newcastle further encourages his king to play to his strengths. For example, it was in the gift of royalists to restore the traditional pleasures that the Puritans had snatched away, condemning them as profane and ungodly. The Duke looks forward to a future time when England will once again celebrate, quote, all the old holidays with their mirth and their rites set up again, unquote. He lists these affectionately, quote, let the people have their lawful recreations, May games, Morris dances, the lords and ladies of the Maypole, and the fool, and the hobby horse must not be forgotten, unquote. The theatres, too, would be reopened. Newcastle intuits, rightly, that these pleasures would win the hearts of the people and channel rowdy spirits into revelry instead of rebellion. It really was an ace up the royal sleeve. The Duke of Newcastle's little book depicted a lost England that might be found again and helped to make that happen at the Restoration in 1660. Charles's actions suggest that he took his old governor's advice on board. We know that the Merry Monarch was dead serious on one point. He was furious about what happened to his father and resolved to play his own cards as well as possible. He was determined to avenge Charles I by winning and by living well. And in doing so, he embodied Machiavelli's idea of virtue, which is successful action. He lost the battle, but ultimately won the war. He would not be paralyzed by scruple as his father often had been. Charles II misled the Scottish Presbyterians in order to defeat a set of Englishmen who were even more puritanical and therefore dangerous. He had no compunctions about deceiving the Scots and treated the Anglican church flippantly, using it as a mere instrument of politics whereas his father saw himself as a martyr to that church. Whereas Charles I had been a virtuous husband and father, a fact that never seemed to count with the Puritans, Charles II was a cynical rake who flaunted a harem full of mistresses and bastards. He took St. Augustine's famous line, O Lord, make me good, but not yet, to an extreme, waiting to convert to Catholicism until his deathbed when James brought Father Huddleston to receive him into the church. This good man once saved your life, sire, James said. Now he comes to save your soul. Charles II had his own struggles with Parliament, ultimately dismissing them and ruling as an absolute monarch for the last four years of his reign. And yet, even Whig historians seem to shrug this off. It seems that fortune smiled on Charles II, but Newcastle's little book can't have hurt either. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do comment below. And you will also find a link to a booklet I've written on the Jacobites in the description to this video.